everybody. Welcome to the Ron Line Report. Excellent guest today. One of the legends of the sport. He's the Iron Warrior, Mike Christian, joining us from the Dallas, Texas area. How are you, Mike? I'm doing well. How are y'all? Uh, very, very well. I, I want to I wanna tell a little story. You were the first pro bodybuilder I ever met. I don't know if you know that. So oh, no. situation was, uh, I was living, I had done one year of school at UCSB and then I wanted to live in Venice for that summer, so I, I uh, was in a house with a bunch of people on Indiana Ave. was around the corner from Gold's. I don't know if you remember. Yes, yes, I remember Indiana Ave. It was a rough area, but uh, hey, yes, so I, I got a job down Shore the street. Trips over there. <laughs> what did you say? It was what did you say about it? Shoreline yeah. trips over there. <laughs> it was cra- okay. I knew there was some gang. I wasn't sure which yeah. one, but now now I know. Yeah. So uh, I worked at a, a. I got a job down the street on Lincoln Lincoln Boulevard in Marine Del Rey at a place called Music Plus. Uh-huh. And you used to go there to rent your videos. Yes, that's right. So you, you came in one day, and I was like, oh, my God, that's my Christian. I had just started following the sport less than a year before that. Uh, <laughs> I had pictures of you all up over my uh, my dorm room. And, um, you know, as you came there to return your movie or check out a movie, whatever it was, I was, yeah. trying, to think, I was trying to think of something to say. I like, I got to say something. And I wanted to sound like I knew, what I, I knew the sport, and I knew what, you know, I was 18 years old. I was a dummy. <laughs> <laughs> like you had, I believe you had just won the, the pro world in, in Ohio that year, maybe a couple months. And it was on TV because back then we had bodybuilding on TV. Remember? Yeah. Thank goodness. Yeah. And um, I don't know. I don't know. You know, it's just... <laughs> and then um, the next time I saw you, I was too chicken shit to go inside golds. I wanted to, but I was so scared. Just wow, it, it, Ron. it intimidated the crap out of me. And I went in there one day just to see if I could peek in the door and see what it looked like. Yeah, and I and and you came walking out the door, and you must. <laughs> and I think I just I had just met you like the day or two before. You said, yeah. "Hey, you know," you said, "Hey, how you doing?" I was like, and I I probably just ran away. I was just uh, I was a little kid, but uh, you know when I was reading the magazines back then, and you know at, back then it was you, Lee Haney, Rich Gaspari, yeah. Barry DeMay, Gary Stridham, Lee Labrada. Man, it was a magical, magical time. I had a uh, there was a poster I had of you. I moved back to Boston shortly after, but you, I don't know, you must have seen it. I think it was Jim 80 or somebody made the poster. It was you in that shot that Arnold, they made the Arnold Trophy and the Arnold Sculpture. It was a twisting rear double bicep. Yeah. Oh, uh, yes. It was a huge poster, like probably half life size or more. Uh-huh. And yeah. So, yeah, you were definitely someone that inspired the hell out of me back in the day. Yeah, it was the good old days, Ron. The good old days. I loved them. <laughs> yeah, so much fun. I don't know where to begin, but I'm going to I'm going to walk through uh, your early years with people because a lot of our viewers, they might vaguely know your name, but they don't know much about you. So I want I want them to understand who yes. this guy is. So uh, let's see. Believe it or not, you're 63 years old now. 64 now. 64. I mean, my God, you, you, you've been posting videos on your Facebook <laughs> and, you know, I'm sure people are in in awe that you're yeah. 64 years old. You do not look a day over. 50 maybe i don't know <laughs> you're doing something right mike because you're looking fantastic and lean and muscular thank you healthy you know we can't unfortunately we, Ooh, Jesus. <laughs> i mean i've known guys that i grew up with that are no longer with us because they didn't do it the, the healthy way we'll get to that later but absolutely me too so let's see you started uh life off in uh cleveland ohio mm-hmm. uh, you lived there you lost your mom at nine and yep. your dad your dad moved the family out to South Central Los Angeles. Yes. Uh, but before that, you were you were very much into martial arts before before weights and all that. Wow, that's right. Yeah, we did an interview for Muscle Mag a long time ago, but I remember because <laughs> we talked about we had the same Bruce Lee poster on our wall. It was that <laughs> it was that one like that? We had the slashes here and here from Enter the Dragon. Yes, yeah. I just wore a short shirt yesterday. <laughs> wow. So yeah, you know, Dorian Yates also inspired by Bruce Lee. He was the yeah. man. Um, so you were very, very much into martial arts, but when you got out to South Central, uh, you got into, uh, you, you ended up in the gang life, and yeah, uh, gang. and you actually became a, a leader of a, a local gang, I guess, yes, but, uh, and that's how you got into training, which is, it's kind of odd, because I remember that was like a big thing with the gangs in LA. They were, lo- they were into getting big and buff. It was exactly, that's it wasn't I mean. just guns and Uzis and this and that they wanted to be right. jacked. I mean, yeah. if you've seen pictures, I'm, you might, I'm, I'm sure you're very familiar with Stanley Tukey Williams. Yeah, I know him very well. A monster. These guys were huge. Yeah. They were jacked. So yeah. that's, that, that's why you started training was, was, you know, basically to be a tougher guy than you already were. 
Exactly. We were uh, trying to knock out somebody, really. <laughs> and I'm imagining you knocked out a couple people in your youth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a little, little crazy stuff back in the day. <laughs> so uh, it didn't. You didn't get into bodybuilding. Your dad got you out of uh, out of L.A. You guys went back to to Portland, Oregon. Yeah. And that's tell us how you got into bodybuilding when you were back in Portland. Well, I just start just lifting weights and get big and buff and. It wasn't nothing special. I just, you know, wanted to get in shape and look good and you yeah. know, walk around. You met uh, you met a bodybuilder at, uh, when we when we interviewed before. There was a rec center that you trained at, and there was a guy who competed there, a guy named Chuck Amato. Chuck Amato, yeah. And was he the first person that took a look at you and said, "Kid, you yep. got you got some genetics. You should try bodybuilding." Yes, exactly. I think he placed like fifth in Miss America back in uh, Casey Beater's days. You know. Yeah, I wow, I mean, those, those were those were the good old definitely. days, for sure. But uh, how did you actually start competing? Well, he got me started competing. He got me started going to go my first contest, which was was hard to do. We talked to him for over a year to get into it because I just I was in my gang life, so I wasn't gang life and just wearing little small panties, basically, you know, right, right, right. going on stage oiled up. So it was a different life for me. Sure. Um, he talked me into it. I won my first contest, won my first contest. And that was like the turning point in my life. Because in the gang, when I knocked out somebody, all the guys would say, ah, Mike Chris, Mike, Mike, you're bad, you know, all that. that you know, and I needed that kind of high. Yeah. When I won my first contest, it was the same type of high on the pictures and exposure and everybody greeting me and yelling and the cameras taking, you know, nuts. So the same kind of, you know, exhilaration that I needed. Mm. And uh, that was it. I was hooked. I won my first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one. I got that blessed. I was lucky. Yeah. You even told me a funny story back then about how you were a kid back. This is, you're still a teenager, right? Or early 20s. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, you would go to other gyms and, and see people <laughs> that were going to be competing against you. And you'd tell them, don't bother showing up because I'm going to win. Yeah, and, I was still, I had that gang, you know. Mine, uh, mine in, in me, and uh, yeah, I would go to them to tell them, don't bother to go in because I'm going to beat you. Up. <laughs> but you did beat them. <laughs> yeah, and I did beat them. <laughs> you would, you would look like a fool if you, if these guys beat you. But you were, you're pretty uh, unstoppable for a while there. Uh, yeah. So you know, when did you, when did you make the leap from local shows and all that to start, starting thinking about maybe I could do this on a much higher level. Maybe I'm good enough to be a professional. Yeah, that's that's a very good question, Ron. Basically, what happened is I entered all the contests in Oregon, won everything except for the the Northwest o- Northwest overall. I won my heavyweight class, yeah. and I felt like they were kind of holding me back because I was my attitude, you know, my kind of you know way I was. They yeah. were holding me back, so um, I started to think about going to California. Hmm. I took off in my van, went to California, and. That was it. Met the wow. Barbarian brothers and <laughs> whole so, life. So you started, you, you went back there, you moved back there with just, just a van and uh, some clothes and all that, right? Exactly. Van wow. and some clothes. Wow. Some so, yeah. What was it like? What was it like? Cause it's so many guys go out there and they, they try to make it as a bodybuilder an actor or whatever. And as you know, they, they're, they go back home with their tail between the legs. Oh how did, yeah. I'm how, does, did, was how, did, how did you, how did you survive out there on your own? Yeah, I seen guys sleeping outside the back door and go to the gym, take a shower, come back outside, work out, and go back in their car and sleep and eat and the whole thing. I've seen it all, but um, um, I, I think it's just my uh, determination and drive to really make it and uh, and just do my best. And I think that was it. I was just I had the attitude, I had the yeah. attitude that I wasn't going to give up, I wasn't going to quit. I was a fighter from the gang, of course, and um, just was determined. So uh, this is when things started to happen for you. You, did the, you won the Cal overall in 1983. 83. And for people that don't know the Cal, it's probably not as prestigious Ooh. now, but, it you know. Was, it was it like was, a Miss America back then. If you won the Cal, you were probably going to be a pro back then. That, that's yeah. how tough the Cal used to be. Absolutely. Uh, you, could, you could rattle off like 20 pros who, who had won the pro or had won the Cal. That's uh, right. And so then you, you went to the Nationals the next year, which was only the second year that the NPC Nationals was ever held. Lee Haney was the right. first champ, right. uh, and you were the second Nash- NPC national champion ever. Yes. yes. But as these young kids today don't understand, that didn't even give you a pro card. No. <laughs> you had to win the universe to get a pro card then. 
So where did you have to go? Dime a dozen nowadays. <laughs> they they do give a lot of pro cards out now, but uh, you know I'm even looking back at like some of the names in your heavyweight class alone. What did it say? You were uh, Matt Mendenhall was in your was second in to yeah. you at that show. Rory Rory Liedlmeier. Yes. Uh, you know you you Jeff, competed Jeff against Williams, big who? guy, little young kid Jeff Williams. Jeff Williams, Jeff Sneed. Sneed. I mean, yeah. The the talent back then, the talent pool. Yeah, because for one thing, there was no super heavyweight class. Everybody right. over 198 was was just a heavyweight. Heavyweight. So you're up there with 205, 205 225, 250, 270. You're all one giant yeah. group. Absolutely. And, um, man, some of the guys that could not turn pro in that era, they're so much better than the guys turning pro now. It's just, it's it's not even funny. It's not even funny. Absolutely, yeah. I sound bitter but, when I say I, it, so. <laughs> I'm not yeah. Gonna... <laughs> So, uh, what country was the World Amateur Championships held in? And it was Cologne, Germany. Okay. So, let's see. You beat, wow. You had beat 54 guys to win the Nationals, your class. Yes. I mean, people can't even comprehend a class that big, but that's how big. 57 guys in your heavyweight class in Cologne, Germany. Uh, You got heavyweight win, got your pro card. And the guy who had won light heavies at Nationals, Rich Gaspari, also went. He went to Germany and got his pro card the yes. same year. And John Natashak, if people remember John, he's he's an NPC judge now. He was the middleweight one. Great for the league. And second place runner-up to you in that uh, world was Barry DeMay. That's right, Barry DeMay. And man, the talent pool back then was just phenomenal. Uh, Crazy. So, now it was Barry's second or third time placing second. So it was, it, was, it was tough for him, but he was unbelievable that year. It was, it was a tough contest. So where did you go from there? Because, you know, now you're a pro. What do you, what do you think to yourself? What do, what do I do now? How did life well, change for you? Well, uh, from there, I got a lot of exposure in the magazines. They were saying that I was the only one that had the frame that could beat Lee Haney. So they were mm-hmm. matching me against Lee Haney right off the top. Right. So uh, I knew I had to train as hard as I can and go in the best shape I can and do the best I can. I was trying to beat Lee Haney. <laughs> you know, I had the only, you know, far, far frame. Was Zeke that could do it, right? And he and he told people he was a, I was the only one he was afraid of. Yeah, because Mike I mean, Chris was the only one that you know really intimidated him. You know, <laughs> I mean, if you think back, I mean, Lee was about Lee was five eleven. You were six one, and you know, six one, but with really wide shoulders, very right. small hips. You had that X frame. You know, Rich Gaspari was five eight. Lee LeBron, right. I believe, was like five five or five six. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah. these guys, it was very hard for them to stand next to Lee and compare, you yes. know. But you were this, you were like one of the only guy back then that really had the same frame and the same type of mass that Lee had. Exactly, so, yeah, and the hard. <laughs> yeah, condition wise, I, I don't recall you ever being out of shape in an IFBB show. And yes, you did, ma- and you did many IFBB shows. Yeah, I, mean, I, I actually to tell you a little story. I wouldn't go into a contest unless I was better than the last contest. If you remember, if you recall, in 1988, I didn't go into Mr. Olympia. Right, which was right there in L.A. Yeah, yeah. it was leg day. That was the problem. <laughs> but, uh, I didn't go in there because I didn't see the improvement that I wanted to make going into the show. I mean, I had to improve dramatically to go in the next contest or I would not go in. And that's the living proof of it. <laughs> so what were you looking for? What, what improvements were you hoping to, to make that you hadn't made at that point? Well, I was I was trying to work more on my legs and my calves. You know, okay. I knew my upper body was big, and coming from you know the surroundings that I grew up in, I really worked upper body a lot. You know, arms and chest and back and stuff like that. So I knew I had to work on my legs. So what I did is off season, I wouldn't train my upper body at all. I would just wow. train my legs. I wouldn't wow. train my arms, my shoulders, because that way I felt it would catch up. Wow. So I had to let it kind of stand still and let the legs catch up to everybody. So wow. every year I got better and better and better. And that was because I improved my symmetry and, you know, I got harder. I got bigger, you know, put on some weight. So, so, I, so you, you would body. only train your upper body, like, how, much, how many months out of the year then in that, in that scenario? Uh, I mean, no more than three months out of the year. Wow. Because, wow. Yeah. you know, I, I would basically train it just for a contest. I would train probably three months before a contest. Wow. So three months after the year, I would train upper body. Wow. You know, I remember hearing that you didn't train arms until like right before a show, right. which made arms. sense because your arms were crazy back in the day. Crazy. And shoulders. 
soldiers here, arms of soldiers. I didn't train them. I yeah. waited till contest time, nine de- ninety days before. Wow. <laughs> so what? <laughs> so contest prep. You know, I guess this is kind of leads me to my next thing. We we talk about Kevin Leveroni, how he used to do that. He would he would get smaller in the off season than you know three months before a show, four months before the Olympia. He would put all that muscle back on, and he would look like a different person by the Olympia. And you were doing that long before exactly. Kevin was doing that. For him, exactly. Yes, yeah. sir. <laughs> so, like, what would exactly. you you competed around two forty five? What would your weight come down to in the off season? Down to probably two fifteen, two twenty. Wow. Yeah, and, and this I is the same thing as Kevin Lebron. I put on 15, 20 pounds. It was amazing because everybody before the show would see me in the gym and count me out. Oh, right. he's not gonna make it this time. Look how little he is, you know. But yeah. I didn't believe in be honest with you, staying on the juice all year round like most of the other guys did. They could not see other people seeing them and looking and go to them saying, is that Mike Christian? Is that Lee Haney? Is that Richard Smarty? Is that Gary Stratum? You know, yeah. because he was smaller. So they had to kind of want to stay, you know, as big as possible so people would know who they were. But I wow. just kind of didn't bother me a bit. And I have the ego trip at all. And I just wow. I went down. One time to go to the contest, boom, 100%. But I did everything right, Ron. I would eat. Because I I, put, I would work with my back against the wall. I would like to work like that because I would uh, 90 days or so. Most people work 12 weeks work or, or longer. Yeah. I work back against the wall, three months or so, eat, sleep, train, amino acids, do everything perfect. I didn't miss a day. Mm. And they, as you know, most of the bodybuilders now, they kind of take a little out here, a little out here, a little out here. I didn't do that. Do that. Mm. Day one. When eight weeks before it sold, nine days or so, boom, they had everything. Everything was had to be perfect right on time. So you know, you, you seemed like someone to me who had a fast metabolism, who was kind of naturally on the leaner side. Absolutely. Uh, you know, like if you had never started lifting weights, you probably would have been just a tall, athletic-looking guy. Exactly. Uh, so when you did your contest prep, did you have to diet very strictly, go low carbs, do a ton of cardio, or were you just really just putting the muscle mass back on while eating clean? I was putting the muscle mass back on. It, I was a hard, uh, 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 had a hard time eating. I, would, I could eat one time a day, two times a day, and I'd be full all day. So wow. I had to feed myself going into the show. Last two months, three months of the show, I had to force feed myself, force, force feed myself. eating six times a day, protein, carbohydrates, just and training my butt off twice a day. Yeah, and this is going to blow. This is going to blow people's minds. But you, you said this in an interview, and you basically just alluded to it. You know. Guys now never come off gear. They just don't. Yeah. You know, to them, being off is 500 milligrams of test plus exactly. GH. You didn't use gear for 42 weeks out of the year. You would only you would only go on <laughs> right before a work, show. Huh? Oh, this is our it's our old interview. I was just looking up what we did, and I'm going to run through the. This is what you told me that you used, and people are going to call you a liar because yeah, I know because nowadays I'm sure you're aware of how much guys use now, I'm and I'm not. Awesome. Uh, the sissy compared to what the guys do now. I'm not like, even talking about pros. Show. I'm talking about like the guys at my gym that they use way more than you use. Just your local guys who aren't even competing. Competing. So, so I'm going to tell people this this cycle, and they're going to they're either going to laugh or think you're a liar or something. And oh, a no couple problem. a couple wise people will go will go. Hmm. Yeah, that actually sounds very reasonable. Yeah. Okay. So this was Mike's cycle in his heyday when he was competing, ripped at 245 pounds. Yes. Top three, top four in the Olympia. This is what he was doing: two hundred fifty milligrams of tests every right. five days, two hundred with two hundred milligrams of Deca every five days, right. six Anavar a day, and those were five milligram tabs at the time, I believe. The old Cyril. No, I think it was two and a half, maybe. Two and a half. Yeah, so, two and a half. So let's do fifteen milligrams of Anavar a day. I guarantee you, the bikini girls out there use. <laughs> I'm not a kidding. I wish I was kidding, Mike. And then a uh, parabolin once a week, which came in 176 milligram amps back then from France. Exactly, that was it. That was, that was it. it. That was wow. it. And you know what it was, Ron? Uh, my body, uh, because I'm genetically gifted, of course, but um, my body would respond so fast. And uh, the pumps that I would get in the gym, I felt like my muscles were going to actually burst. So it scared me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Believe it or not, it scared me. So I said, if I'm taking this amount and I'm getting this gains and looking as good, if I take more, I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm yeah. a buster. I was, I was scared, and which was good. You know, you should be scared to take too much stuff. Anything you can take too much of anything and get 
you know, hurt or sick or whatever, you know. So I was taking enough that was making me big, hard, everything was working fine. And uh, like I said, another thing that these guys do nowadays, they take five, or they take 10 different items. I would take two or three, see how it worked for a, a four or five weeks, a couple of weeks. Then I would take something out, put something in to find out what gear worked for me. You know, and I don't advocate taking gear at all, but just right, a right. professional bodybuilder, that's what I did for a living, and I did what I had to do. Yeah. And I mean, did you ever push it harder than that, or was that pretty much the way you did did all your cycles? That's how I did most of my cycles. I was you know, scared. I was actually scared that you know, my muscles were going to explode. <laughs> but I mean, looking at you, you look fantastic. You're 64 years old. Yeah. You, you look healthy. You look young. Yeah. Uh, you haven't lost any kidneys or your, your, you know, all your organs. I, I've never heard, I've never heard any stories about you having like kidney failure or, you know, heart attacks or anything like that. You, you've never had any of that issue. I'm I've not going to so, so blessed. I mean, I haven't even really had any injury as far as my muscles, you know, like wow. knee, back and all that. And I think it's because Ron, I was taught from Chuck Amato the correct form hmm. workout. So I always had great form whenever I did my squats, my deadlifts, my bent over rows, you know, whatever. It was good good form. And of course, when you use bad form, you're using two or three muscle groups to get it up. You're going to hurt your back or your traps, your arms or your legs, you know, when you're using all them body parts to get the weight up, you know, just to get the weight, weight up. Yeah. So I believe in real good form, and I think that's why I didn't have any injuries. Any did you also, I, I, you know, I only saw you train in some tapes. I think I used to try to, I, I went to gold, I, yeah, the old VHS tapes, like Road to the Olympia of 1987, 19, those are good tapes, man, but uh, I, I can't recall, did, were you a real heavy trainer, did you go down into low reps, or were you more like a, you know, like people, people knock Phil Heath, because he didn't train like a power lifter, whereas Ronnie did, but, you know, unfortunately, we see Ronnie's paid the, paid a very, very steep price for those heavy, heavy weights, exactly. were you, were you into the very heavy weights, or were you yeah, more into, oh, you were? all the time and I still stay as heavy as I can. I don't go nowhere near I we used to do but before I used to do like uh squat uh, uh squats with six hundred pounds I did one rep with six hundred pounds wow. for rep five hundred for five or six times easy. Um leg press I did two thousand pounds with ten reps. Okay. You know, you know back in then I was pretty yeah. heavy, you know? All yeah, the way that's... down, all the way up, good form. That's so, heavy I'm... in any day, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but it was pretty easy for me back in the day. But I mean, basically, Ron, put a camera on Mike Chris and he can do anything. <laughs> no, I, I remember that the best tapes were like, because uh, like everyone used to come out to L.A. to train for the Olympia. Yeah. They'd all yeah. they'd all stay at that uh, Marina Pacific Hotel, which was a couple yeah. blocks away. They trained yeah. at Gold's. And uh, Hotel, uh, right. Yeah. I just remember Party tapes work. with Lee Haney was in there training for the Olympia. Yeah. And, you know, you guys were just giving each other crap. It was hilarious. <laughs> We're, and we're super good friends, but we would do, I would yeah. give him crap all the time. <laughs> yeah, you could tell it was good. Talk back to me, but I would give him crap. <laughs> yeah. hey, you know, I think you guys did have, you had more of a camaraderie because there weren't that many pros back then. Yes, sir. And, you know, if you didn't, all the pros either lived in Venice or they would come to Venice and spend part of the year there at some point, or sure. usually for the Olympia six or whatever. Months, yeah, four or five, six months before a contest, yeah. So you guys but, really but, were. Plus you, know you traveled together, too. Mm -hmm. You know what I really want to uh, 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 say, Ron, is I think the main thing that score, sport is missing now is charisma. I mean, I was blessed. I have it. Either, I think you have it or you don't have it. I mean, you look at seven times with Olympia here, seven times here, eight times here. They really didn't have that charisma that Arnold had. Mm. I was blessed to have the charisma, but I didn't win the course Olympia. But I think that's what the sport is missing now. I think yeah. you have to have a charisma for entertainment. For the people to come see, the, the want to come, come see shows in the Bible. So the same old polls here and here. You know, somebody like Kai Green, I respect him. He's an entertainer. He's mm. got muscle. He shows the muscle. He entertains. You know, I think I think the sport's missing a little charisma nowadays. I think the, <laughs> some of the bodybuilders got to get it. I don't know how they can get it because it's been so long. It's been 30 years since Arnold and, you know, me, Platts, people like that. But nobody, and Kai Green, I got Kai Green. Nobody really has charisma nowadays. I well, think the sport's really missing that. The the ironic thing is, if there had been like Instagram and YouTube and all that back when you were competing, people wow. would have gotten to see the personalities and the charisma of people like you and Platts. Whereas now, you know, 
these guys try, but they don't all have, not yeah. everybody's got a personality. You can't force, yeah. you can't force that. You either have it or you don't. But I, uh, yeah. I, I feel bad because some of the fans did get to be around you guys and saw what you were really like, but most of them just would see pictures in the magazine and that was it. Yeah. Whereas yeah. If yeah you but the, most of them, some of them, when they actually came up to me, I would sign everybody's autograph. I would talk to them. And actually, when we used to do a uh, 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 photo signing at like the Cologne in Germany, yep. I would actually uh, sign the photo, get up, take the person's hand, say, how you doing? If they had a baby, hey, what's the little baby's name? You know, I would I would have a, a, like a, something going with them. You know, I would feel like we're one-on-one, -on -one, you know? Most of the guys then back then were just signing the next time. <laughs> wouldn't even look at the people, <laughs> you know, because it was money, you know? Right, right, right. I, I wouldn't make as much money as them guys, but... At least I had a, a, a relationship that people felt with them. And to yeah. this day, 30 years later, they'll say, Mike, you remember this and that? And you said this and my kid. And they showed a picture of the kid when they were 10 years old. Now they're 30, 40 <laughs> years old now. Wow. Makes me kind, of, kind of old, but it was it was an enjoyable time for me, Ron. A very enjoyable time. Yeah. And, you know, in, in some ways, I think it was uh, there was more, you know, there's more opportunity on the Internet because you don't even have to be a pro now. You could be anybody that's got a little bit of muscle. And if you have a personality, you can sort of make a name for yourself and get yes. followers and this and that. But, sure. you know, back back in your day, there was a very small elite group of pros. And Absolutely. you used to go to places like FIBO convent, the FIBO uh, Expo in Germany every year. And every you guys year. would sell stacks and stacks of pic autographed pictures. Absolutely. And, VHS tapes, tank tops, T-shirts. Yeah. Um, so in that aspect, you know, because now everyone gets everything for free on their phone. Right. And if, they, if you take a picture with a pro at a show, it's with your phone. You're not paying. Nobody's buying pictures anymore. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. For sure, Ron. <laughs> really was a good old days in a lot of ways. Yeah, uh, but I think the, the personality is kind of missing in the sport. Not, they're not either showing it or they don't have it or, you know, I don't know what it is, but I think um, – more of the guys who show more of their personality. People want to know who they are. It, yeah. it, it takes two minutes to say hi and how you doing. I, hey, I train at so-and-so gym. You know, I come down anytime in California. I'll be in there from so-and-so time and, you know, come out and work out with me. I would say it to people. Yeah. I would kind of get to know each and every individual. And that's hard to do when you got a line clear across the block, you know, because right. you know, you're trying to make money. And after so long, people stand in line and say, forget it, I'm gone. So, But... That's why you did that. You probably met people 35 years ago, and they they still remember that you took the time to sit there and talk to them and their kid and whatever. And you know that's that's a fan for life. Yeah, I I don't I, to be honest with you. I don't remember everything. <laughs> they remember every single thing, Ron. I, I just say yeah, 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 because I, you know, I did it. I made everybody feel personable. You know. Right, right. Well, I, I got maybe hundreds of people on the internet and say, oh, the first time I met you, you showed me here and, and did this. And, and I would always do that. If a guy would come down to the gym, even if he wasn't a pro, I would uh, try to show him around, places to go and eat, like Lee Haney. Lee Haney called me his babysitter, actually. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. From Atlanta to here, I showed him you know, vitamins to take. Don't take showers upstairs. Stay away from here. Go there. <laughs> eat this. <laughs> this is the vitamins. Like, you know, I kind of I was like the ambassador or the, or the mayor of Gold's Gym back then, you know. Wow. I would always tell people. I, it was in my heart. I think it was also came from Ron is the, the the years that I did in the gang where I did, you know, violence to harm to people. I wanted to turn my whole life around. Mm. So my whole life, the rest of the 30 years from, the, you know, 20, I mean, 20 to 30, 30, 30 35 years, yeah. I wanted to help people. I want to show them I'm a nice guy. I want to, if I can do anything to help you, if, of what do you need? I give you a place to stay. I would do everything, Ron. You yeah. hear it on the internet nowadays. You say, oh, I remember this when I first met you. You did this. And, you know, people like um, uh, Eddie Robinson and people like uh, uh, Chris Comer. He said the same thing you said. I was mm. the first pro he met. He said, yeah. I'm the one that got him started in bodybuilding. Wow. <laughs> Watch wow. me guest pose. And another thing I did was um, when I guest pose, I didn't do regular conventional poses. As you know, I have my own shots of Christian. And I used to do this thing called the the, the walking crab, where I actually did the crab, and I would go up, <laughs> and walk to another competitor. You know? Oh man! So yeah. I'm ready to kind of guys get it from now. 
And uh, I did a, a thing called the tricep shake where I would actually go like that and <laughs> look at the people and wait for them to get that, ah, and I hit it, you know. They plastered his legs, you know. Yeah, you yeah, got yeah. to have that charisma, man. You got to, you know, you got to entertain the people, you know. And I think, you know, like I said, I'm redundant and I'll keep on saying that, but I think that's what is missing the most in the sport. Yeah, I remember one of the Olympia uh, event specials, it, maybe, was it 87? Were you in the 87 Olympia? Yes. I don't know. Okay, so NBC did a big uh, a one-hour special on that that I probably watched on VHS 50, oh. 50 or 60 times. And they asked you in your interview, like, do you ever, uh, do, you ever do you guys ever try to intimidate each other backstage or anything? And yeah. you, you said, sometimes you might throw a tricep in somebody's face. <laughs> I'm thinking, that's a big tricep that this guy's got to throw in your face, for God's sake. Yeah. You know <laughs> well, what? It's funny because another story I would do is that, I wait till all the guys take their stuff off. I would leave my stuff on. They would all get oil from them already. I wait till the last minute, and I would take my stuff off, and then boom, all eyes be on me. Uh, <laughs> I was big, ripped to the bone. Oh man, it was it is a it had a great feeling, man. <laughs> but I was right, so gonna... my intimidation thing. I would kind of wait till the last minute, stay covered up. In the gym, I would I would never uh, wear a tank top. Really? The, last, the only time I wore a tank top or I took off my clothes and sold uh, the, the people in the gym was the last week for so, week, 10 days or so. And that was because of the fans in Gold's Gym that couldn't go to Columbus or Ohio or, where, you know, wherever, Germany or whatever, to see me at the, at the Olympia or the Arnold Classic. I would tell them what I had because I, I was their man. You know, I was yeah. a Gold's Gym boy, so I was, I was the man. So I would take off my shirt, go in the back, Go to them when the light is real good and the mirror is back yep. there and take it all off and so then you see some of some of my videos you can see that there. Yeah. But, you used to wear you used to wear your own clothing shirt. line. You had uh, platinum everywhere. Platinum everywhere, yeah. Big giant those boat neck yeah. giant but sweatshirts with the with your traps popping out. Yeah. And, uh, and the baggy pants. Yeah, that's what Small I used to face, baggy legs made for us. Yes. Yeah. I mean I, I used to wear them because they they gave the illusion of smaller people looking bigger so i was like these things are awesome i had <laughs> i had your stuff i had crazy wear i had t michael man people you know i know they, they laugh when they look at the fanny packs and all that now but man those were the days uh, so getting back to the career because uh, i want to let people know you know how good you were your first mr olympia contest you were fifth place uh second mr olympia 86 you were third to lee haney and rich gaspari yeah uh, 88, you had your first pro wins. You won the U.S. Pro Grand Prix, the World Pro. Uh, in 1989, you won one Grand Prix in Germany and two different Grand Prix shows in Spain. Yes. Different cities, I assume. Uh, yeah. The 90 Arnold Classic. So 90 was your last year in the IFBB. Uh, you took second place to Mike Ashley uh, because Sean, that was the year that they they tested it. And Sean, Sean, unfortunately, got popped like two days later. You had to send back the money and the trophy and everything. <laughs> And I got more money, and everybody went up. It was great for me. <laughs> yeah, you bought, you went up a spot, and then that was your last Olympia, correct? Nineteen ninety, no. yeah. You I, were fourth I, place. Last Olympia, that was the one that drug tested in uh, uh, Chicago. Yeah, and you know, but the one was Mike, Mike, Mike Ashley was in. That was the one that um, you know, I took like the fifth or fourth. Fourth, fifth, 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 you were fifth, fourth, yeah. Yeah, and, that, that was that was a show. It was drug tested. I had did everything perfect. I ate right. I slept right. I, you know, I knew about the drug test and everything. So I, I knew I had to get enough rest, enough eat, and had to have everything right on time. And I looked the best I looked in years in that 90 Olympia. A lot of people felt that I could have won the Olympia, of course, me or Sean Ray, I, I, I felt. So um, but I prepared myself for that show, and I did my absolute best. And you know what I had to do, Ron? Mm. After that show, I had to look in the mirror and say, you know what, Mike Christian? You will never be Mr. Olympia. If I didn't win that year, Ron, I was never yeah. going to win. Wow. <laughs> that year, I was at my best. Lee Haney was off. He was off. He was off. Was a little off. Both of them guys were a little off, but I was on one. So if I wasn't going to win that year, I had to look in the mirror and say, you know what? You're never going to be Mr. Olympia. And that's when I joined the WBF and got paid $300,000 a year. Yeah, that's this is mind-blowing to people to hear this because – yeah, you know, they might. Some of these younger guys watching might not even realize. So Vince McMahon, who we all know from WWE now, yeah. he started. He decided he was going to start his own bodybuilding federation, and federation. he did. He had tons of money to back it up with. Absolutely. And he, he took uh, a a great group of guys uh, away from the <laughs> IPB, including you. And uh, yeah, you were one of their top guys. Yeah. Three 
and they got he offered you three hundred grand a year. Yes. And and you actually gave Joe Weider a chance to to come close to it or something. <laughs> correct. Nope. Sorry, yeah. I, yeah I, I was the one of the very few, if not the only one, that got the um, Vince McMahon flew me out to um, Connecticut and offered me his offer. I came back to California. Joe and me and Joe were good friends. So I went up to Joe and I said, listen, Joe, I don't expect you to give me $300,000, but I got a, I got a kid, I got a home, you know, I want to pay my rent, I want to pay my mortgage, I want to buy stuff, I want to do things. And you can't do it going to the bank saying, I think I'm going to be in the top five in Miss Olympia, <laughs> you know, yeah. and get $20,000. Right. I need something. So I said, if you can give me something, Joe, I'd be happy to stay with you. Joe told me, look me right now. I says, Mike, I won't compete. There's no problem. I shook his hand, left, and we parted. Yeah. You know, but after that, he did have to start giving contracts to guys. Yeah, that's right. That's what we did. We did get that. <laughs> so if it hadn't been for you and the other guys getting the WF contracts, that's right. contracts would never really become a thing in bodybuilding. That's right. Hmm. Very few had them. So, you know, what was it like? All of a sudden, you, you probably never had that kind of money coming in. Man. Uh, you know, what did that? I, I think it ended. It, it didn't end well. I, I remember right. that. So, what happened when you started getting all this money and you didn't have a lot of obligations anymore, really? Right. Well, every month I would get a check for $25,000. I would look at the check for five minutes every <laughs> month. $25,000? I'm not doing anything? Yeah. <laughs> it was unbelievable. Mm. And, you know, no guest pose, no nothing. Right. So, um, of course, it, it ended up bad, but um, we had too much time on our hands. He should have started an amateur federation, so we had places to guest pose at. Mm. We had nowhere to go, nowhere for him to get his money back. We tried to talk to Vince, but Vince is Vince. You know, he wanted to run his way, so, right. you know, God bless him. He, he did it his way, but um, if he would have started an amateur federation and we could have guest posed, got some of his money back, I think that would have, it would have worked. But I was looking at that that move that I was going to be a next, like a Hulk Hogan. I saw mm -hmm. what he did to wrestlers. I had charisma. I had that entertainment thing in me going. I wanted to be a movie star, an actor, the whole thing. So yeah. I felt that was the right move for me. I felt that we were going to have Iron Warrior dolls, and, you know, all over the magazines and doing this and TV. And, and you know, I just, I, I was really looking forward to it. It was, it was the happiest moment of my life when I actually joined him, I thought. Yeah. And, you know, he he did put on a, a great, I think they only held yeah. two two championships. Two, but, yes. Uh, was the first one in first, Long Beach? No, it was the last city. Last city. But uh, production values were obviously incredible. Vince knows how to put on WrestleMania and all that. So Absolutely. You, you guys, you all got characters. You you know, you already had your own character, Iron Warrior. Right. But, uh, you know, it was tremendous production values. And he tried to make it, he tried to make it sort of entertaining in the way that yeah. pro wrestling is entertaining. Yes, yeah. exactly. Do you which, think it, it was a good move? I mean, we needed entertainment in the field. So, I mean, it, it was, I thought it was a smart move going in that direction. It's just he needed some type of way to get his money back, and he really didn't see that. And of course, the second year, he said that, um, that the feds was looking at him, of course. So um, yeah. they were looking at steroids, thinking he was selling steroids to the wrestlers. They were saying this is you know, what. Yeah, there was a big scandal with the wrestlers yeah. at that time. So basically, he uh, kind of, I don't want to say it, but kind of threw us under the bus and mm. said that we had to uh, compete uh, uh, steroid free. Right, and that was a big, uh, a big difference because we had never did it in our life. We had competed right. with, the, of course, the Royds and won all our shows, and it was very difficult on me because I had to go on the show knowing I wasn't going to be better than I was the last the year before. And I mm. always, my whole career, I had got better every show, so I had to go on the show knowing I was not going to be at my best, and that that was a, a big pull in my mind. Mm. And when, a lot, along with we had too much time on our hands, we had no place to guest pose. We started going to strip bars and doing all kinds of crazy things. And, you know, commercial drugs came into it. And it, just, it was a bad time for me. It was one of the worst yeah. times in my life uh, after did, the second year. Did you end up doing that second WBF championships? Yes, I looked okay. terrible, of course. And I was on drugs, but <laughs> yes, I did. Well, I mean, you know, the only guy I remember, I remember vaguely, Stridham is the only guy that looked. Stridham, I don't think, was tested. I'm sorry. I'm just going to no, say it. Because he looked, he was like 260, ripped, full, veiny, hard. There's, there's no way, obviously. But everyone else looked, can I say it, like ass. 
I mean, yeah. like Mike Quinn was fat. Uh, oh Jesus, yes. Everybody was smaller and smoother, as as you would expect when you take the drugs away. That, that's yeah. you know, unless then, you've had time that, and you. That that that's what really sent me into a, a downward spiral because I looked at it and says the same thing's happening again. You know, I left mm -hmm. the W the the, the, the weeder, you know, because I had a chance of winning that Olympia that year, and they, you know, the athletic league it didn't go my way. I, I think so. Um. I went to the WBF and I thought it was going to be different. Right. And the same thing happened again. So I was just like, oh, man. <laughs> and he, he dissolved. It didn't last much longer after that second show, year. correct? Yeah, second year. He dissolved. So what happened? He just, because you guys were on a contract, he just didn't renew the contracts? He didn't renew the contract, exactly. So where did you go from there? You had all this money coming in. And, you know, you had basically burned bridge. Everyone, on the, everyone that had gone over to WBF was persona non grata for the IFBB for a while. Yes. So yes. Where did you I didn't come back. Out of all the guys, I'm the only one to come back. And we saw I a lot of that was gonna be Ron, you know. <laughs> well, we saw we saw guys come back and they got they did get screwed over a lot of them. Yes. Did. I mean they sent the one the contest Ron I, I gotta admit that, but they could have placed higher for sure. No right. question. They they put them three or four places lower for sure. No question about that. And so what did, Right. What happened? What happened to you when it all when the WBF went away? I had a problem with drugs. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how how bad did it get? How did you get past that in your life and move on? No, I went to rehab. I went to ten different rehabs. I went to. I had a hard time for a whole year, a year straight. My wife left me. My my kids I had a hard time. It was a spiral time of my life. And then I got in rehab. I got together finally after a year. I went to actually Vancouver. And uh, got away from my whole environment in, in California. I had to because it was there. And was, you know, after a couple months, I would just go back and, and, and get it, you know. Yeah. So I was in a different environment. I got clean in Vancouver with a good friend of mine, Manny Valente. And um, everything just went went great after that. I came back home. I ran my business. And I kind of did, did my own thing. I didn't want to compete anymore. But I ran my business. My business back then was a multi-million dollar operation. I was in Northlands making pretty close to a million a year and uh big five a million a year so I was, I was doing some good numbers back then so i didn't need bodybuilding i mean did you you didn't miss you didn't miss competing and all that and traveling with the guys and you, you there must have been some part of you that, that still missed yeah, it a little bit i missed it of course i missed that but um well, i was making good money and that was the main thing you know after so so much time ron it becomes um when you see the political things that goes on in it becomes more or less money you know, yeah. so yeah. if you're not making next to my money, you know, then yeah. it's not that interesting as it was when you first got into it. You wanted to win the contest for a three dollar trophy before, remember? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, plastic. We always call it a plastic trophy, even though they're yeah, not always plastic. <laughs> Sometimes they are plastic. Trophy, but they're all plastic. Well, back in the days, they did have nice trophies. Oh, beautiful trophies, yeah. man. They uh -huh. gave me a sword. Actually, when I went to California in 1983, they gave me a sword. Wow. First I've given something like that out. I was so thrilled, man. So worried. I wanted. I think the Cal gave a sword out for because when Flex Wheeler won the Cal, I remember he had a sword too. He a sword too. Yeah, they start giving different stuff out. Thank yeah. goodness. Instead of regular trophies. And... Do you have Do you have like one contest that stands out in your mind that was like either you won or it was just like your favorite look or the best experience? Is there any one contest out of all the ones you did over all the years that really stands out in your mind as the best time, the best experience? Yeah, I think of one when I won the European Championship in 89. I think that's the one that I was at my absolute best. I had an unbelievable posing routine. I had a choreographed routine, and it was just, uh, I was on. The people went nuts every time they saw me. I was in great shape. It, it's a funny story. I'll tell you the story. Yeah. <laughs> um, they had five contests in a row. They had two, a first a first two in Sweden. So I went to Sweden, and me and the guys were in the show. So somebody had suggested I had calf implants. Oh. So Wayne D'Amelia had to come to my room and check and said, if you got calf implants, you got a bad job, basically. Because <laughs> <laughs> they weren't huge calves, you know? Right, yeah. Twins calves, like people thought. So um, the guys, top guy, said that they weren't going to compete unless I got x-rays. <laughs> So I had to stay up all night, Ron, running. Mm -hmm. Me and Wayne DeMille runs different places in, in Sweden 
where they don't have like 24 hour places. Yeah. If somebody had an x ray machine, x ray my calf, because the top five said, we won't compete unless he gets x rayed. Who was behind all that? Did you, did you ever find out? Yeah, I know who was behind it. Sean, was it Sean? Come on, Sean. No, when Sean wasn't in the show. Because <laughs> Sean did that to Flex Wheeler a few years uh, after that. It, it was, it was uh, that last contest, the top five was uh, Gary Stridham, Bob Paris. Um, mm. Well, mm. but I mean, you know, else. looking, I, I remember your physique yeah. very well. Who? Never knew. Those, 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 those oh, okay. guys that were. Saying that I had calf implants and they didn't want to compete with me with that calf implants. And did did your calf? Coach. Did your calf suddenly get bigger or something? Yes, I worked my butt off. I was okay. trying to win. I was trying to win five shows in a row. I had never been done before. Five hmm. in a row. So I was going to compete in the two in, uh, in Sweden and the other three I won. So hmm. what happened? Because they kept me up all night. I couldn't carve up. I couldn't get the rest. I didn't look my best. I took second. I would have won all five of them. Uh, so that I was a be air stride in all five of them. No question about it. That was a good. That was a good strategy on their part, though. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it did, it did its job. I was off the first two days. It was one more was Friday, one more Saturday. So I was off them two days. But after I got on a week later, it was all over. <laughs> you started winning. You started winning again. Yeah. Yeah, they so, couldn't. They couldn't touch me. I was so much above all of them. You can see some of the pictures. Oh, yeah. you were you were massive. You had that. You know, we talk about. There's a rare look with that real full roundness that you just don't yeah. see it. I mean, that's something like Phil Heath dominated with. Right. Uh, you were one of the few guys ever back in those days that had that look. That's you know, true, Lee, Lee, Lee didn't have that. I mean, I'm trying to think of anybody else in that era um, that really had that fullness. Yeah, that big, hard fullness I had. I was one of the first ones before Ronnie Coleman and some of the other guys came out. Yeah. I was the, the mass monster back then, I guess. <laughs> I mean, because you were you were about two fifty. You were close to two fifty ripped. Two fifty ripped, exactly. And that was that was unheard of back then, you know. Yeah. You know, we had, <laughs> I mean, now you got guys that are like five foot six at two fifty, but yeah, that's right, Ron. <laughs> back in your day, you know, Lee Haney won most of his Olympias in the two forties. Forties. Labrada was like one eighty five, one ninety. Rich was probably like two ten, two fifteen. Yeah. yeah. You know, you, you, was you, yeah, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, Barrett and May was probably two something, two thirty five, two thirty 230 at six foot, you know? Yeah. Right. yeah. But I was, I, mean, I was the, the big being striving with the big mass monsters back then. Yeah. Um, you know, back, back in those days, there was just bodybuilding. It was men's and women's bodybuilding. You know, if, if somebody and went, pairs. huh? And pairs. Yeah. Mixed pairs. That's right. I actually talked, I, I told someone about that today and they didn't believe that was a real thing. I had yeah. to find it on my phone to show them. I said, yes, there was a mixed pair. A man and a woman would compete in a routine against other couples. Oh, yeah. Tony Pixel won a bunch of them. John, uh, John Brown won a few of them. Yeah. It was a thing for a couple of years. Yeah, Diana Dennis and some guy Kevin won tons of them too. Yeah. But, uh, but say, if, if I could go back in time to 1986 and show you all these different divisions that we have now, uh, bikini, figure, fitness, women's physique, uh, men's physique with the board shorts, classic physique. Uh, you know, what would you have thought back then? Would, about... would, Brian, I would never believe you. Yeah. I would, it would never work. <laughs> Not that many. I mean, I, bikini, a few of them, I think, would have been okay, but I would have never thought that all of them would have made it. And I thought women's bodybuilding wouldn't move. I thought it was going to be there forever, too. You know, I mean, that was Miss Olympia seven times, Corey, and then the Murray, you know, all these great people, and you know, ten times uh, Iris, uh, you know. So it was, it was, it was something big back then. And then, but of course, the sport wasn't uh, making the money on the, on the output of the women's bodybuilding, so they decided yeah. to. Uh, I, mean, I talked to Linda Murray. We did an interview a couple weeks ago, and you know, we reminded people that back in those days, it wasn't all the Olympias weren't all. Well, there was only men, Ms., Mr. Ms. Right, but they, they weren't they weren't packaged together like everything yeah. is now. Separate, separate dates, separate cities. And I yep. went to a few Ms. Olympias back in the day. I went to most of the ones that Linda won. Mm -hmm. And they packed the theaters. The Shrine, oh. Audit the Shrine Auditorium in L.A., I don't know how many people that seats. 10,000? At least 5,000. 5,000. It, it was packed. And that was just for the Ms. Olympia. So, yeah. But it, you know it's coming back, though. You were at the Olympia. You heard that announcement, right? Yeah. 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 So that, that's cool. I well, hope so, because uh, them girls worked so hard to get them physiques, and you know, I mean, you know, 
Yeah. I mean, where do they go now? You know, once you, you know, they stop the game, it's, where do you go? Where do you? How do you make money? How do you make a living? I mean, if you did this for all your life, or you know, ten no. years of your life, what do you what do you do now? So I felt so bad for. Them. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the, the, you know, there was there was there was we didn't lose women's bodybuilding. It was always still we still had women's bodybuilding yeah. shows, but they were few and far between. Yes, uh, they've been making a real comeback in the past few years because this uh, Jake Wood wings of strength and Tim Gardner. They've been putting on a lot more. Pro women shows. Yes, women's uh, So, Mike, you have a great perspective that you know most, very few people have because you you've seen all the changes throughout the years. What changes have you think have been for the better? What changes in our sport and industry have been for the worse? Um, I think that the better is the bikini and all the shows that they got now. The men's fitness and all that. I think that's to the better. No question about that. Okay. Um, because of the mass monsters that were coming out, and it was just you know, the stomachs and you know the bellies and what was going on. I think uh, they're changing that somewhat and having a classic physique. So that's what we looked at, looked like when we were in the sport, and, and that's getting a lot of uh, 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 talk about that and becoming pretty popular and pretty big now. I think that's the best change I've seen seen uh, in the bodybuilding. But uh, worse wise is I think is. Uh, the guys aren't in condition like they were, but I mean, you heard this a thousand times from a thousand of them, you know. I say it every day. <laughs> yeah, from Coleman to Dennis uh, Wolf to everybody, you know. It's just the condition the guys have nowadays. They're more just trying to get big. And if you look at it, Ron, what was so strange about the sport now and back then is before you could cut off the head of me, Lee Haney, Lee Brody, you would know the physique. Yep. Now you can cut off the heads and guys, you don't know who's who. They all kind of look the same. They're all big, they big calves, big legs, big arms, big everything. Yeah. You know, they're round, they're full, they ain't ripped to the bone, you know, but right, they're right. All the same. They're big and hard, you know? Yeah. And uh, that 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 kind of bothers me uh, out of sports. You could you can back then you could tell what physique was who and who oh. was who. And now I, you, I could absolutely cut the heads off, I'd say, okay, that's my Christian. Yes. That's Lee Haney. That's Barry that's DeMay. Right. That's Gaspari. Absolutely. That's Labrada. It was you knew right away who was who. Yeah, but nowadays, man, you cut the heads off, man. You're you're guessing, you know. It's like saying, they, I think it's so and so. Yeah, it's like they rolled off an assembly line. But yeah, yeah you know, progress. Spike, what are you what are you up to these days? Hmm? What are you up to these days? How do you stay busy? Uh, I do personal training. And do a few uh, uh, things here and there, talking at events and, you know, church, work with kids. That's what I'm doing now. Okay. I'm working on a book, of course. Oh, book. okay. It's coming out soon, early next year. I've been working on it for the last 10 years. I say, but, you never had a book. I've been, I've realized you never did write a book. It, this, the book is a, is a biography of me, so it's going to take a long time. Six years of my life, so it's taking a long wow. time. I want it right. So I've been back and forth, back and forth, and different writers and stuff because I'm a, I'm a perfectionist so yeah. it's not quite how I want it it goes through the whole uh my mom when she passed away into the gang into the winning the shows and then you know from the you know the bad yeah. times I had with the WBF to you know coming back and you know finding God and you know finding my purpose in life I got a beautiful wife here I just I love living here in Texas now it's away from California you know and you got money and you got good times. You know what comes with that. Problems come mm -hmm. with that. So yeah. here I'm more relaxed. I'm happy. I feel good. Like I said, I've got a wonderful wife, Yvonne. And um, we're just having a, a wonderful time. We're, we're, we oh. love going to church. We love God. We pray every day. And um, I'm, I'm happy. I'm, you know, in my life, you know, I'm not making millions like I was making before. But I'm, I'm really happy. First time in my life, I think. Wow, that's good. So good to hear. You know, when you when you have the book done, I'd love to have you back on to talk about it, promote it, anything we can do. Because yeah, you're one of the you're one of the coolest guys. I mean, like I said, you you were you were nice to me the first time we met, and that you don't forget stuff like that, you know. Because I was a little I was a little nobody. You didn't have to be nice to me and talk to me, but you did. So, Thank you. Ron. Appreciate yeah. it. A lot of the guys weren't like that either. You're right. <laughs> well, a lot of the guys weren't like that. I can this, name ten of them right off the top of my head. Well. <laughs> you know? Thank He's probably going to get mad if he hears this, but the second pro body I met at the same video store was Gary Strideham, and he was not as nice as you. Put it that way. <laughs> he I was. Di I understand he was dieting for the Olympia, but still, yeah, he was just like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I can name. I can name a bunch of them like that. You know? <laughs> a bunch of 
um, that were my little boys back then. But once they won a contest, they were like, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Change. Okay, they went. The Christian is nowadays now, huh? They went Hollywood. You no, know, the nose got all up here, and they're like, wow. Yeah. But, you know, it's funny because um, a little another little story is, I helped Sean Ray win the Nationals. He came to me two days, uh, three, three, three days before the Nationals. He said, Mike, he said, man, I'm too heavy now. I got to get rid of this water and, you know, some problems I had. And I dialed him right in. So what to do, what to take, what to do. And, and he dialed in. He won the Nationals that year. Wow. And, um, you know, it, 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 it was really something because all the years after the, that, he never mentioned me in the, in the magazine article or anything. I helped him win the show. I never heard that. I never heard that. <laughs> yeah, but listen, 30 years later, yeah. we're doing an interview at Muscle Beach when I won the Muscle Beach Hall of Fame there. Yeah. He, he's on the uh, the mic and he says, I wouldn't have won the Nationals without Mike Christian. I said, oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I mean, I just went wow. nuts right on the TV because I like, wow. it took you 30 years to say this, son. <laughs> So Mike, I, I should have asked you this before, but did you have a coach at any point, or were you did you did you prep yourself for all those shows? It's everything myself. I basically, I don't believe in having to have need a coach. I, I believe in looking in the mirror and you can see yourself. You know when you're safe and when you're not safe. No. So I would just judge on the mirror. I'll go. And uh, what was very important to me, what I did, was the last four weeks for the show. I had a big old mirror in my house, and I'm looking mirror every morning. Get up and look at it. Do my side pose front. I look at look at everything, and if I can see something change every week, then I need I need to make a move. I lower my carbs, up my carbs, my cardio, train harder, more intense, negative, whatever. You know, yeah. you have to see something in the tricep coming in across or something lying down inside your leg. If mm. something's not changed in the last four weeks for the show, it's time to make a move. And most yeah. body don't get that. They just look there and say, I'll be all right and fine. And that made me, um, I had my mind was clear and free. When they see me at the concert, I was laughing and joking and giggling and yeah. having fun because I did my homework. Right, right, right. homework. You don't have to worry about it. You know, yeah. I don't put wine in like the last minute and eat candy bars and all that. If I'm looking good all the way up to the show, I'm doing what I'm doing, I'm going to stay with it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I remember, you know, you, you had a good time with everything. You, you kept a great attitude because yeah. I remember seeing you in Golds many times and you'd, you'd be laughing with people and other guys would be, <laughs> other guys would be like giving you the death glare. Like, you, you yeah. know, they'll kill you if you try to talk to them. But, you know, you were, you were like the mayor of that place from what I remember. <laughs> yeah, everybody loved Mike. <laughs> you were just a cool yeah. guy. You know, you and Charles, Charles Glass. You knew everybody. Yeah. So, well, Mike, thank you so much for taking all this time. Uh, yes, I'd like to do this again sometime in the future because, yes, man, you're a cool guy and I like talking to you. That's all. <laughs> thank you. Thank you guys for listening. God bless you. All right. So, everybody, thanks for watching Ron Line Report. This has been Ron with Mike Christian, the Iron Warrior. Thanks for watching.